This interview is being held on May 22, 2017 in Granbury, Texas. I am Penny Galt and I'm a member of Mary Isham Keith National Society Daughters of the American Revolution. I will be interviewing Khan Shuck, a veteran of the Vietnam War. Also in attendance is Dawn Needles, a member of Mary Ashen Keith, who will be scribing the interview. Okay, Con, let's start with just some biographical information. Okay. When were you born? I was born September 16, 1937. And where were you born? In Fairbury, Nebraska. What was your father's full name? His full name was Cecil Shuck. He did not have a middle name. Okay. And uh, what did he do for a living? He lost his farm after the Depression in Nebraska. Loaded my mother and my two sisters and brother in the car, and we drove to California. Oh, okay. And then he became uh, uh, just a laborer, and then he wound up being a, a uh, bricklayer and a uh, farmer in Oregon. Okay. What was your mother's? Full name? Emma Elizabeth Shuck. Okay. And did she work outside the home? Uh, she did. She uh, she worked at a, a uh, operation in Eugene, Oregon called the Eugene Fruit Growers Association. It was a place that canned fruits and vegetables. Okay. And she ran the operated the machine to put the lid on the cans. Did you have any brothers and sisters or sisters? I had two, two older sisters and one older brother. Okay. Did any of them serve in the military? My brother served 28 years in the Navy. Okay. And are you, uh, you are married? You had told yes, me before yes. that you are married. And your wife's full name? It's Carol Ann Shuck. Okay. Do you have any children? Two boys. Okay. Would you give their names? Brian Keith Shuck and Gregory Nelson Shuck. Uh, do either of them serve in the military or have no. they served in the military? Okay. I tried to get... <laughs> Well, uh, before you entered the service, what were you doing? I quit high school in the 10th grade because I knew all there was to know. <laughs> I got in the Marine Corps and found I didn't know nothing. <laughs> so you, you had been just in high school before you before you joined the military. And so you enlisted. I enlisted. Correct. And why did you choose the Marines, correct? It was on a bet. One of my friends had enlisted and uh, didn't make it through boot camp. Hmm. And we made a bet that I could make it through boot camp. And I did. And you did. <laughs> what was the date that you entered your military? I enlisted on the 8th of November, 1954. Okay. Starting from the day you left home, when you got on a plane or bus okay. or however you did, tell me about your military service. I, I uh, physically boarded the plane in Portland, Oregon, after my physical. To San Diego, to San Diego, uh, to boot camp. And then from there to Camp Pendleton for the combat infantry training. And after the infantry training in San Diego, or Camp Pendleton, I went to uh, Jacksonville, Florida for aviation fundamentals. Then to Memphis, Tennessee, where we had uh, all the aircraft schools. I went to the, it didn't make it to the electronic school because I couldn't learn most of Morse code. Hmm. But I did uh, make it to the jet engine course and the, and the recipient engine course. From there, I went to, Cal to uh, El Toro, California. And uh, El Toro, I was attached to squadrons, the headquarters squadron, Fleet Reinforced Pacific. And we had several different kinds of airplanes. And uh, I got a chance to work and fly on all of them. The, uh, Can you tell me what kind of planes there were? Well, we had the, uh, the AD Stellarator. Okay, what is that? It's, it's a uh, fighter aircraft. Okay. It, 
single engine Recep. We had the SNV, which was the, it was the Beechcraft. It was a twin engine. We carried probably eight or ten passengers. We had the R4D, which is the uh, 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 C47, and the R5D, which is the DC4, and we also had the R4Y, which is a Convair twin engine. Of course, the R4D, the R5D, and the Convair are all transports. Okay. I had the opportunity to uh, in Marine Corps terms, become a first mech and then a crew chief on all three airplanes, which helped me in future years. Right. I, uh, I went to Iwakuni, Japan in 1956. And I was in Iwakuni uh, in basically working on the R5Ds. In a squadron called Mars 17, that's Marine Aircraft Repair Squadron, I think you know that. And from there, uh, I came back to the States and went to Anacostia, which was a base just outside Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I had a, uh, we, I was there, I was training reserves on airplanes I'd never seen before. The, the airplanes, you had never seen the uh, airplane before, but you were training. <laughs> we had, the, we had, the airplane was the, uh, was the uh, A4 Skyhawk, and uh, it, was, uh, really, it was really good duty for, uh, for a Marine to, to be around Washington, D.C., yeah. and uh, I had a chance to, to meet the Senator, uh, John F. Kennedy, before, before you become President. So, and the man had a tremendous uh, command presence. He, he walked in the room, he knew he was somebody important. Hmm. And then, in 1958, uh, I went aboard a Navy aircraft carrier that the, the Marine Corps basically was taking over. It was supposed to be a ship company operation with all the Marines on that ship. And I was, uh, I was an elevator operator, which I did not like that duty at all. I just did not like it. And in June of 1960, I got out of the Marine Corps. Okay. Uh, I went home to the family farm, and I worked and worked and worked. And my dad came in after about 25 days and said, son, you get a job or get your butt back in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So I chose the Marine Corps because I couldn't find a job. Mm. And when I came back in, I went to El Toro, which is in Orange County, California. And I got into the C-130, the squadron that was the initial squadron to receive C-130s in the Marine Corps. At that time, the Marine Corps called it a GV-1. And, uh, I immediately went into flight engineer training. But the Marine Corps wasn't making, I was a buck sergeant. The Marine Corps wasn't making any buck sergeant flight engineers. They was training all the older senior enlisted as a flight engineer. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was the first mech, first mechanic on, on the zb ones And uh, I did that for a few months. And then the, uh, I was part of the group that went out with Iwa, to Iwakuni, Japan to reform a squadron that had been uh, decommissioned. Uh, VMR 152 was decommissioned and uh, was being recommissioned as VMGR 152. What, do you know what the VMG <clears throat> Well, uh, again, in Marine Corps terms, the V was uh, fixed wing. Okay. Uh, M was marine. Okay. G was gas for refueling. Okay. And R was transport. Oh, okay. okay. The uh, and then we we took the initial issue out. It was four airplanes. 
But four airplanes, we did a lot of work on four airplanes. Then in April, uh, that was in 1960, that was 1961. In April 1962, uh, the CO called me in and asked me to, to select four men that could fix anything on that aircraft. And I selected four individuals. I can only remember three of them. And we were sent down to South Vietnam in a place called Sock Frank in 1962. And our instructions were that no airplane stay on the ground overnight. Oh, really? The, uh, we lived in a crash helicopter that had, we managed to turn up right and slept in. A crashed helicopter? No. It was just the hull of a helicopter? Just the hull of a helicopter. And that's where you lived? That's where I lived. Mm. The, uh, after about three months, we finally got a tent set up. But I think that the helicopter was better <laughs> than the tent. <coughs> yeah, we do. It was, uh, there was two Marine helicopter squadrons there, and, and I don't remember the numbers of the names of the squadrons, right. but we were supporting them. Uh, every day we had C-130s come in and uh, bring supplies and things, and we had to go down low and the airplanes fixed and lost them again. But then we did that from April to November. In November, we moved our C-130 detachment back up to uh, Da Nang. And, they, uh, and from there, I come on home. But I spent uh, April to September, November in uh, Vietnam. Okay. And that was during the John F. Kennedy years when he was president. I came back to the States in... Uh, okay, and what years were, was this? 62. Okay. Then in, uh, when I came back to the States, I went to uh, Alameda, California. And again, training reserves. And uh, this uh, was a... Um, A good job for Marines, but again, with the all the fighting going on in Vietnam, it was really it really hadn't started yet, but it, you knew it was happening. Mm -hmm. and I was there until 1966, and uh, in 1966, I was transferred back to El Toro. And as soon as I got to El Toro, I immediately went back into flight and air training. But this time I was a staff, I was a staff sergeant, and uh, since I had all the previous experience, I made pleasure almost immediately. And we were flying combat missions out of El Toro into Vietnam. From the United States? Yes. Hmm. And by, by combat, I mean, we were taking troops and supplies into Vietnam. Right. In 1967, I was transferred to uh, back to VMGR 152 that was based in Okinawa, but we were spending uh, probably three weeks a month in Vietnam. Hmm. Back to Okinawa, back to Vietnam. And uh, during those, during that tour, uh, was, I say it, <clears throat> We were flying into every airfield you can think of in Vietnam. And we was flying the Sark Trang, Chu Lai, Kong Thien, Wei Phu Bai, Khe San, Quang Tri, Dong Ha, all the, all the various air bases. Again, carrying troops and supplies, they hand in. As also part of the missions, we were, as we flew the good guy, the live ones in, we brought the dead ones out. Oh my goodness. And uh, it's really amazed me to see so many dead bodies stacked up along the runway to come out. Mm -hmm. And I was there through Tet in 1968 when uh, we, uh, I, I came back to the States 
I think it was April of 68. Uh, then I almost immediately went back out on another tour. And uh, that in, ooh, I went back out in at late 68. Okay. And uh, then I come back in late 69. Went back out in 71 and come back in 72. Now each time you went out, were you going back to Vietnam? Yeah. Okay. okay. Again, we were based in Okinawa, but we were flying. Into. You know, we, were, we stayed in Vietnam for uh, five, six days, and then back to Okinawa. Just back for a couple of days and back to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So, I, I took, uh, I took R&R &R in Hawaii in 1968 and got married in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I sent my girlfriend a, a ticket to Hawaii and said, if you want to get married, show up. And she did. <laughs> so, then in 1972, I made Master Sergeant, came back to the States and went back to, went to Norfolk, Virginia. You know, I was on a Navy staff in Norfolk. It was called Calm Navigator Land. There was five Marines and 537 sailors. Hmm. And uh, I served on that staff until I retired in 1974. Okay. Well, going back to your your service in Vietnam and, okay. back and through there, if you don't mind no. going back to that. Uh, were you... You flew into the air bases. Were these in combat zones? Yes. Okay, so you flew into combat. Mm -hmm. you, you, were you fired at? Were you? Oh yeah. Really? Can you tell me about your experience of? Well, there's. I, I told my wife and everybody else that two things you'll never forget, and that's the sound of a rifle, a bullet going to the cockpit of C-130, and the smell of death that these guys was hauling up. Two terrible things. I, I could come out of uh, almost every landing at Kingston, we got shot. Hmm. We, had, a, we had a roll of tape, aluminum tape. I, I called it 100 mile an hour tape because you'd pass your bullet hole with a piece of tape until they got a chance to go back to it all and get repaired. Hmm. I still got the roll of tape in my garage. Really? Yeah. Hmm. So you flew into danger oh, yeah. daily, or however many times you flew in mm -hmm. and out. And when you flew in, was it a turnaround, or did you come in and stay for a while? It basically basically turnaround, it's basically turnarounds. Basic, because you said you were picking up. It cased on, uh, we opened the doors and pushed the cargo out the back end and turned around and took off. Never, never shut the engines down. Was that because you didn't dare shut them down, yeah. or was it, oh, you just had to make it in there and out quick because it was yeah, so heavy. In and out quick. The fighting was so intense yeah. in that area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, was there anybody in your military service that really made an impression on you? Any individual, any friend, instructor, or? Yeah, I've got a very, very dear friend that passed away almost two years ago, Henry Bud Wildfang, probably the best pilot I ever flew with. Uh, he died, well, he, he lived up in Midwest City, Oklahoma. And after I retired, I'd go up probably once a month to see Bud and, and uh, just talk, talk about Vietnam and mm -hmm. what he's mm -hmm. doing since. He moved down to, uh, to be with his son down in Rockport, Texas. And he lived down there about four or five years until he passed away. About, he they passed away, I think it was May two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, good pilot, good friend. So it was just a lifelong friend. Yeah. Right. Do you, did you think your training in the United States that you got before you were sent over to Vietnam and into battle 
uh, situations. Do you think your training prepared you for that? Not really. What What is it you think that, I mean, what did they tell you was going to be here and what was the actuality of what you, you came? Well, the, uh, that's a hard question to answer here. That here in the States, when you're training, you're, you're, you're trying to, you're working under ideal situations. Right. And there you're not. The, uh, you, you, you were flying, flying there, and I say flying, I step between the pilot and the co-pilot and basically keep them out of trouble. <laughs> but the, the planes there on the, on the C-130 <clears throat> managed all of the control systems, you know, the, the electrical panels, uh, the uh, hydraulic panels, the uh, refueling panels. Our, our airplanes had a refueling hose on each side, and then we controlled the flow of the gas to the other receiving aircraft. Hmm. So that's all the lines of situations out there. You're, you're, you're not. In, uh, if you were on the refueling mission in Vietnam, we would fly up to uh, about 19,000 feet, and you, with the racetrack pattern, you'd fly refueling the Navy and Marine aircraft that were returning from South Vietnam. They go to they go to North Vietnam and drop their bombs and such, and then they come back and refuel before going to their, their aircraft here. Hmm. So it was not ideal. It was not like what they told you it was going to be. Like. We, it looked good on paper. <laughs> no, it, looked, it looks good on paper. Yeah, right. You said that you have some, and if you don't want to talk about this, you don't have to. But you have some health problems because of of things in, in Vietnam. Yeah, I'm a uh, the, I am on the uh, Asian Orange list with the, with the Veterans Administration. I I am seventy percent disabled. Okay. How did you? If you were in the air on with these airplanes, how did you get? How did Agent Orange come? We well, we used to pick up Agent Orange in our airplanes in July and take it to one of the bases called Confian. Agent Orange come in barrels, mm -hmm. and we carry it from Shulai to Kantian, then offload it. Our airplanes were contaminated. Hmm. Well, I'll be, because when thinking of Agent Orange, because I mean, I, I was certainly an adult during the Vietnam War. Uh, I thought it was when it was sprayed out over countryside that that was how, you know, the well, contamination. It, it had to get to the jungle somehow. Yeah. Right, and so, your planes literally became contaminated because you were transporting this agent mm -hmm. from one place to another. Yeah. That, that's interesting. I never, I never thought of that. I, you know, I just honestly thought that the only way you would get that is if you got sprayed when you were down in the jungle. The, uh, the most times my airplane was ever hit was coming out of Comfy Inn after dropping off some major orange. And when I landed back at Da Nang, we had over a hundred holes in the airplane. Oh my goodness. Now, tell me the size of this airplane that you're in, a C-130. Are those those great big airplanes? Now, this is big. It's a big uh, four-engine transport. Okay. And I cannot remember the exact dimensions. Oh, no, no. That's, I mean, it's just a big plane. That's yeah, probably 120 feet long. Oh, wings, okay. Wingspan about 90 feet. Oh, so it's a big, it's a big plane. I, t I take it it was not a very fast plane. Well, it, it, we had uh, two or five engines, and it, it was pretty fast. But, but uh, I mean, did. you still had to taxi a good way before you could get up and and become. No, it, it was considered a short field aircraft. We really, could, we could take off and with uh, a not normal load and twelve hundred feet. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, I would think of the plane that big that it would have to lumber along for a while before and then the whole time everybody's they're shooting at you and you're trying to get off the ground no. that that would That's be true. terrifying well we we could take off and in fact I, i've got videos at home of the c-130 during their test trials on landing c-130s on their character really yes goodness 
that's a lot of plane to land on. Yeah, not that much. I mean, aircraft carriers are huge, but still, yeah. to think you're getting a plane that big. They, they, they did that. It was, they never got past the trials. You know, they did, right. They landed it several times on a carrier. Okay, so it was just it was just in trials. They never they, put it into they, battle situations. They proved they could do it. Right. In case they had to, they would they would do it, but they never. If you, if you had to get an engine or some part to a right to a carrier and see it, then we could do it. Right. Right. You had to have a plane that was big enough to carry yeah. something big on it. Okay. When you were over, how did you keep in touch with family back home? Well, my wife and I corresponded by, by um, cassette tapes. Oh, really? Hmm? Okay. The, uh, I could send my little recorder and I could, I could send her love messages and, right. and uh, she could return them. How long would it take you to get, I mean, when you sent it out, how long before you got a reply back? Just a guess. Ah, uh, a week. I'm know. saying a long time. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're so accustomed now to yeah. having instant messaging or mm -hmm. immediately talking to someone. It's hard to imagine having mm -hmm. to wait a while before you hear a response to your. And, and, and I, we had several tapes, so I mean, they'd probably pass each other the mail coming. Right, on. right, yeah. right. But I imagine it was. Always good to get mail from Always home. Good. Yeah, that would that. From what I've heard from other veterans, that was when they were away from the United States. Always looked for mail. That was. It's always a, a pleasant surprise to get a letter from somebody. Right, right. Well, just to know that they remember that you're over there, because <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, when you had free time, did they have USO uh, shows or anything like that that you could? We had USO shows that come into uh, into Da Nang on, on a pretty regular basis. Oh really? Okay. In fact, I had um, I had the pleasure of, of uh, taking one of the US shows all over Vietnam. Uh, we uh, I think of her name. Mm. I'll stay very shortly. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I don't want to say that I can't. It'll come to you. Yeah. It, it'll come but, to you. But, uh, of course, every time we took her someplace, we, we'd get to see the show, too. Right, right. And, uh, why? I said, what happens you turn almost 80? Uh, We took her. We took her into uh, Dong Ha and the Quang Tree and the Kaesan, uh Chu Lai. Just well, when you took them into these places, was it was it a combat? I mean, you're taking in these well, folk celebrities, and were they taking them into places that they had to really be careful? Well, they had to be careful because there was the the, the Vietnamese. The Viet Cong was launching rockets and mortars, but right. that was an everyday experience. You, know, you might go three or four days without like, getting a, right. a mortar or a rocket attack. Right. But these these celebrities or people coming from the United States knew that when they were going into these mm -hmm. areas, yeah. it was... Hmm. It was hostile. Yeah, right, right, right. When you got back, because I remember the end of the war, and I remember veterans coming home from the war. Not all of them were received very well no, we from the received. Vietnam War. Yeah. Can you tell me about... Well, you was called everything from baby killers to, to biggies to war criminals, war crimes and war criminals. Uh, Screamed at. Hmm. It, was, it, was, it was almost like you didn't want to wear your uniform anywhere. You know? I bet. Yeah. And that would be very disheartening to have served your country mm -hmm. and then to come back and, and no one wanting to recognize your service. Matter of fact. You know, the, 
after uh, after Kennedy was assassinated, uh, the uh, I think the whole attitude of the United States changed. Mm. Right, right. Well. Lincoln was the only one, you know, just not used to it. Well, Lincoln, and then of course there was uh, or another president too. And I'm sorry, my knowledge of history is not that is not that good. But yes, that was a, that was a, a shock to the American yeah. uh, nation when that happened. Our security was kind of broken. That's one. That's one of the things that the the you always remember. Where you're at, what you're doing, when you. I remember yeah. exactly where I was and what uh, I was doing. You know, the, that and the, the uh, space uh, the challenger. Challenger, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, all things you can always remember. Right, right. You exactly. remember, remember the day, you know, we use that one. Happened. And what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You're, you're so true. Was it difficult to adjust back to civilian life after being in that constant yes. fear for your life? Yes. Uh, the uh, I, I think the thing I missed most about the Marine Corps was the camaraderie. Right, right. Uh, the uh, most of the Marine always a Marine, and, and mm -hmm. that kind of attitude. Right. So getting back and away from that, but I guess that's why you some not so many, but uh, servicemen now are going back for additional tours in. Hostile countries, because they want to get back with their friends and with the people that they had lived with. First, in fact, up until the time I got married, I was volunteering for Vietnam. Really? Yeah. Goodness, you're a brave soul. <laughs> mm. um, do you feel that when you were in Vietnam and when you came back, do you think the media accurately covered that no. war? No. Do you think they just kind of whitewashed it? And <clears throat> I don't think they really told the public what was going on mm. or why we were there. Right. And maybe that has something to do with why the public was, or not the, all the public, but some people were so anti because they really didn't understand what was going well, on or why no, we were over there. Oh, well, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm. Of course, the, the draft was never popular, but I, but I, think, I think we need a draft today. Yeah. I think that uh, these young kids need to serve the country for a couple of years. Right, right. Uh, many veterans have voiced that opinion. Uh, I've heard that more than once. Uh, what are some life lessons that you learned from the military? Well, no, I thought you got to get your butt out of bed in the morning to work. <laughs> Uh, don't give up. Uh, face the challenges as, as you see them and, and, and get them done. Work hard. Be faithful. You know, uh, God, country, core. Um, All good qualities. All good things to have learned. Uh, how do you, how is your military? How did your military service? Uh, impact your feelings about uh, service and war in general? Nobody likes war. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, if we was a perfect society, uh, but the, um, as long as you got aggressors out there wanting to uh, not love thy neighbor, we need a we need a military to protect our borders. You know, uh, it's, you know, there's there's people out there like the United States and our free society destroyed. And uh, the military gives it the opportunity to not let that happen. Right. right. Do you have any regrets about your military service? No. Or I, in fact, after after 9/11, I volunteered to go back in. I'd, I'd been retired for uh, several years because I, they wouldn't thank me, but I, they said I was too old. I said, well, I may be too old to fly an airplane, but I'm not too old to fly a desk unless somebody else fly the airplanes. Right, right. 
But I, I still wasn't taken. Hmm. Well, at least you offered. I mean, that, that is something. Is there something you would like to say to leave for future generations that are going to see this, this video? Because this will be at the Library of Congress and it will be to where, you know, future generations can see these, these interviews. I, I would say serve your country and serve it well. Do it with honor. That's, that's very good feelings. Very, very good uh, feelings to impart and to tell, and I agree with you. Is there anything that you feel we haven't discussed that you would like to discuss? Well, in, when I was uh, not in Vietnam, I had the opportunity to be the flies there on uh, a general's airplane. Uh, the first one was uh, General Kurlak. The, the Marine Corps was called Brute. That was the not the one that eventually became commandant, but the, his father. And uh, they were based in Hawaii. And we would fly to Hawaii and pick him up and take him into Vietnam and hmm. anywhere he wanted to go. And then uh, he was replaced by a gentleman called Buse. General Buse was a uh, pretty good sighted man. Did the same thing with him in Vietnam. And then later years, I flew with uh, Lewis Walt, Lewis Wilson, who uh, eventually became commandant. And uh, Wilson was a recipient of the Medal of Honor. Really a nice honor to fly with this guy and, and mm -hmm. take him wherever he wanted to go. Right. Nice man. So you got to meet some influential people. I, I met a lot of influential people. Hmm. Well, that, that, that is very nice that you were afforded those, those chances to do yes. that. And your, do you think your military is what, well of course it did because you were with the military. That afforded you the, the opportunity to meet these, these men. Oh yeah. Oh, well, that is good. Um, I certainly want to thank you for giving this interview. Uh, we appreciate your service. Because of your willingness to stand between the United States and her enemy, we're able to have the freedoms and enjoy the freedoms that we do today. Uh, DAR is, in with, is working with the Library of Congress with this to do the Veterans History Project and get interviews of veterans, as many veterans as we can that are willing and want to. And the Library of Congress has promoted or, or made this button which is the Veterans History Project, and it is only given to veterans who have given their oral history. So I would like to present you with this. Well, thank you. And then if you wear it and you go to any function, if you see another veteran, or it would have to be a veteran, someone else with that button on, they have given their, their a Veterans History interview as well, because only the veterans that get their interviews are given those, those buttons. And then I'd also, also like to give you in appreciation from Mary Ash and Keith, a certificate of appreciation for giving your interview and allowing us to uh, ask you questions sometimes that aren't very comfortable, but that you're willing to, to answer. And we certainly appreciate it. You're doing this interview, and we certainly do appreciate your service. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Con. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.